Should parents give their kids money for the down payment on a house? Ron Butler is here and we'll discuss that question and a lot more starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Ron, welcome back. I think everyone knows who you are, but let's start with a very quick review of uh, what does Butler Mortgage do? Butler Mortgage is a mortgage brokerage licensed in Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia, and we are finding people great deals and giving mortgage guidance on uh, product and rates for about, I don't know, 25 years now billions of dollars worth of mortgage origination. We see a lot of applications. We see a lot of situations. And the reason I would go to you as opposed to just going to my bank is the two things you just mentioned, you know, better service, better rates. Uh, You know, I I don't like to beat up the banks on service because they run the gamut of great service to terrible service. Um, What I would say is that in any consumer, any approach to a consumer product, choice is important. And when you're making such a massive financial decision, probably good to get a second opinion about what the best rates are. Simple as that. Now, your last appearance on the show was episode number 334, where we talked about mortgages and home equity refinancing. What are the risks in 2021? That was a great title. That was back in January of 2021. It was so long ago, I still had a beard. We'll put a picture up on the show here. And on that show, you said that mortgage rates haven't been this low since Confederation. So is that still true today? Mortgage rates are on the way up. Fixed mortgage rates have increased in just the last five weeks. Fixed mortgage rates, five-year fixed mortgage rates have gone up a full half of 1%. Wow. And we are recording this on November 8th, 2021. So if someone's watching it in the future, of course, the world will be different. So if I have fantastic credit and let's say I've got a 50% down payment and my debt service ratio is fantastic and I want to get a mortgage, what is the absolute fantastic best rate I can get on a, I don't know, whatever your most common mortgage term is? Sure. Well, if you're a not, not a government insured mortgage, which even has better rates, you're about 2.49, 2.54 on a five-year fixed rate. But the variable, the variable rate is still ridiculously low. You might even find an interest rate if you're if you've got government insured mortgage, which is not the vast majority of mortgages. It's only for people who are putting a small down payment under a million dollar purchase. That rate ridiculously has gone down to about uh, 0.88, which is just crazy. Well, that's less than one percent. Less than one percent, correct? So that's essentially uh, free money. It's, cra- okay. it's crazy. It's crazy. It's 0.88, and uh, for anybody else somewhere between 1.1 and 1.25. So very, very low variable rates. Well, later on in the show, I want to ask you about your expectations for inflation because it seems to me that inflation is higher than 0.88% right now, but we'll, we'll get to that. So also back in January, you recall there was this pandemic going on, which fortunately is all solved and everything's fantastic now, so we don't have to worry about it now. But at that time, there were a lot of people who were moving from the city outside of the city because, hey, we're working remotely. We don't need to live in a tiny little condo downtown. Have you seen that trend reversing at all as people are coming back into the city or not? It hasn't hit home yet. There are people who are noticing that their offices are talking about them returning to some kind of office work on a limited basis soon, the mythical soon. In the summer, it was gonna be now. People were gonna be back now, but um, not so much now. Although literally every day, I think there's a few more people walking around downtown on the path system. You still could probably shoot a cannon off there and hit kill no one, but that there is a little bit more every day. So what is it going to really start to change? Probably sometime next year. We, you know, we, we believe that more and more people will want their, some of their people in for part of the day, for some of the day, for part of the week, for three days a week, two days a week. Some, something will change. We have not seen a massive regret on the part of people that they are going to be called back uh, to a huge commute through their works. So we have not seen a ton of that yet. We have seen slight rumblings of 
oh my God, there's nothing really to do here uh, at all. Like this is far from everywhere. Um, it's not what I thought it was. We hear a little bit of that from people who are, you know, trying to live in Port Dover and places like that. Um, but we haven't seen the real impact yet. What we have seen though, is that, boy, I mean, those prices, people who bought in the last six months in those small towns and rural locations, those prices went way, way up. Um, if there's any people in Ontario who are exposed to overpaying for property, it's probably going to end up being those people. Wow. And Port Dover is great on Friday the 13th, just, just so you know. That's when the big motorcycle conventions are. Okay, so and I agree with you. I don't think it's hit yet. So I'm in my Toronto office at Young and King every couple of weeks, and we're not advocating shooting a cannon off during on the pass system, just so everyone's clear here. But you're absolutely right. It's deserted. My building is largely deserted, and it's a big skyscraper. Um, there's not a lot of people downtown yet. Now, will that change in January? Will it change in the spring? I don't know. I guess we'll find out because at this point, you're right. It's always going to happen soon, soon, soon. So the other thing we talked about last time was lenders. So, and in that discussion, you had mentioned that banks had become very strict with uh, income verification. That was one item that they were becoming much more sticky with. Uh, what are you seeing now? How are approvals these days? I would say nothing has really changed. Um, the big banks are, and, and big lenders in general, um, it's not just the big banks. There's other big lending companies in this country, big mortgage companies in this country, but everyone's careful about income. They're no longer obsessed with COVID because that seems to have shook itself out. Either you're working, you're not working, you are working from home, your income is stable, it's, it's provable. The... There's no big mortgage lender who, a in the A space, in the AAA low rate mortgage market, who is not interested in dead certainty of people's income, solid, careful review of people's income. And that's true today. It was true then. It's true today. It'll probably be true next year. What we've seen a, a little bit of a change on is that some of the alternative lenders have people who do deal with folks who have income that's more difficult to prove because they're self-employed, might be working for some cash, uh, might just choose not to take a lot of money out of their businesses in terms of tax planning, people with some bruised credit. We found that in many ways, those people are getting better access to available mortgages. It's not to say they're not paying a premium. They are paying a premium. As I mentioned, um, we have some low rates available, but these these people are paying higher rates and they're paying some fees. But the availability of mortgages for those people has definitely improved in, since the last time we talked. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, you mentioned that interest rates are very low. Are people tending to go more towards variable rates or more towards fixed rates? Or is there any particular pattern there at all? There's definitely a pattern. We've we've observed a lot of media chatter about interest rates in the last two weeks. We've had the Bank of Nova Scotia economists come out and suggest there will be eight prime rate increases in the next two years. CIBC suggesting five prime rate increases, the CIBC economist. There is definite chatter about prime rate increases. And the governor of the Bank of Canada himself, Jeff Macklin, said that he believes that rates will go up in either April all the way to September. He believes he will be raising prime rate. Well, that's a big time frame, like April 2022 to September 2022. That's a, that's a long time, but there's definitely going to be increases in prime rate. Therefore, those variable rates will go from, let's just take an average of 1.15. They're going to go up to 1.4, 1.65, and on from there. Now. Are they going to go up eight times in two years? Listen, I am. I, I think anybody who's trying to predict out 24 months, well, maybe the best way to describe it is imaginative. I mean, how the hell do you really know? I don't see it. Okay? Uh, but that said, with every single bank economist predicting an increase in prime rate and therefore an increase in variable mortgage rates and 
fixed rates have already gone up, then sure, we're going to we're going to see higher rates next year. And the effect on that is simply this, that people may pause and think a little bit more carefully about what they're going to do in terms of house purchase. But more particularly, their trend of what they use will temporarily jump to fixed because when people hear a lot about prime rate increases, they become gun shy of the variable rate and they like to go with fixed. There's also interestingly a quick burst of purchase activity of people buying houses. They say they want to lock in rates before they go up. So in the strange world of rates going up should tamp down purchase activity in real estate. It actually temporarily has the opposite effect. People run out and buy more houses because they think, oh my God, I got to take advantage of these rates before they're gone. Um, so those two things are happening. So there's been a, a trend to consider fixed rates more in the last I'd say three weeks since the chatter started and still with variables so low, many people still choose variable, but that's the general trends going on right now. Yeah. And people don't understand that if interest rates go from 1% to 2%, that sounds like a 1% increase. Well, no, it's a 50% increase. Your interest rate just doubled. So if you're on a variable rate, if, you know, in a mythical world where all you're paying is interest, your payment just doubled. Well, if you've got a HELOC, if you've got a home equity line of credit on your house, yeah, your payment went up, well, your, your payment went up from 2.45 to 3.45, which is 1%. That's a 33% increase, but it's, it's an interest only product anyway. So you felt the bite immediately of that increase. Yeah, but so long as your pay is going up by 33% a year, it doesn't matter, Ron. So it's not- Should be fine. It should, yes, be, should be fine, not a big deal. Should be fine. Now, one of the banks you mentioned was CIBC. So let's get to our topic today, which is, uh, should I be uh, helping my kid out with a mortgage? CIBC released a report in on October 25th, 2021, Gifting for a down payment, a perspective. And I will put a link to this in the show notes on YouTube so people can read it for themselves. Pretty short report, four pages. And this is the CIBC, I believe, chief economist, Benjamin Tal, who wrote this. He said, the share of first-time home buyers that received help from family members was just under 30% during the past year. Note that this is not a new phenomenon as that share stood at close to 20% in 2015 and has risen gradually since then alongside home prices. as well. No kidding, you told us that back in, in January, but the rate is is increasing. As for the size of the gift, in 2015, it stood at just over 52,000 and has risen steadily since then. The average gift has risen notably to reach a record high of 82,000. First time home buyers are not the only ones receiving gifts, just under 9% of mover uppers, I guess that's an economic term, mover uppers also receive help. Um, and the size of that gift has risen to 128000 in September. The average size of a gift is highly correlated with home prices. Okay, no surprise there. The average size of gift outpaced home price inflation, averaging 9.7% per year, a full two percentage points faster than the growth in home prices. Two-thirds of first-time home buyers that received a gift indicated that the gift was the primary source of their down payment. Gifting amounted to just over $10 billion, accounting for 10% of total down payment. So that tells me that people wouldn't be able to buy houses or a bunch of people without a, a gift from their parents. So question number one, do you agree with what the CIBC report is saying? Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, I've known Benny Tall for the better part of 20 years. Uh, that's the individual involved. And Benny's a smart, smart guy. And you know, it's funny when I when I saw him announce that num those numbers at an industry function, he even looked a little surprised at himself while he was reading it. Like, uh, oh, this is, wow, this is a lot. Uh, and it is a lot. I mean, we, we saw it. We knew it was going on. We knew it was growing radically. We knew it was um, well past anything that we'd imagined five, six, seven years ago. Like, seriously, when I got into the business, long, like basically in the Stone Age, uh, about 26 years ago, um, gifts were like 10 grand like your grandma gave you five thousand dollars your dad gave you 10 grand uh mind you you could buy a decent house in newmarket for 179,000. so things have definitely changed mm -hmm. <laughs> i just go down about that but still big numbers today and i would say that's two things as the study 
discusses, the price of homes has gone up so dramatically in, in six years from 2015. In some regions of Canada, uh, they've gone up. Fifth, they've gone up. They've doubled, nearly doubled since 2015. So you're going to have to have a big, big contribution as a gift to make that purchase price work. And then the next interesting consideration, which the study doesn't mention, is the foundational belief of the gift giver, of the parent, that real estate in Ontario is miraculous, that it's been their lived experience. I mean, if you were, you have to be my age to understand that the price of houses in Ontario, you have to be in your 60s to understand the price of houses in Ontario can go down and stay down. Because the last time it happened was 1990, 31 years ago. So if you're an average 23-year-old back in 1990, you had other things on your mind besides buying a house. I mean, you, you, you weren't in the housing, you weren't in the real estate market at that time. So by the time you got into it, when you were 30, prices were sort of rational and they have just gone up ever since. You could be a 50 52, 53-year-old person, and have had no lived experience in Greater Toronto Area, Golden Horseshoe, of real estate prices ever going down in any meaningful way for any length of time. And if that's your lived experience, wouldn't you like to pass on this miraculous wealth enhancer to your kids? So you got two things. You've had a huge run up in the price of your home, so you have some equity available in it. And you are a true believer. You believe that your kids should get into the housing market as quick as possible. Yeah, and and I'm old like you. I bought my first house in 1989. And I sold it. And I tell the story in my book, Straight Talk on Your Money, still available on Amazon. I sold that house, I believe, seven years later at a loss. Yeah. Yeah. So I timed it absolutely perfectly wrong. Now, of course, the next house has gone up and the next house has gone up and it, it's all been good. Is it your, so you're absolutely right. It does happen. But if you're under the age of, you know, if your age doesn't start with a six, you probably don't remember it. Absolutely. Is, is it your perception that parents are unlocking the equity in their house and, and giving their kids money? Are they, or are they using savings or are they borrowing to give their kids the down payment? Well, it's both. It's uh, successful parents who've also in the last two years have had an extraordinary run up in their investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. So cash in some investments. I mean, I guess if a guy bought Bitcoin five years ago, he could just sell six coins and here's your down payment kit. Uh, but yes, absolutely. HELOC, HELOCs were in place. Uh, there's a lot of people with two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars dollars $300,000 HELOCs on their homes, unused, untapped uh, balances. And it's easy access. Nobody's going to ask any questions when you take a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand out. It, the, 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 the limit is there. You can make use of it. Uh, so it's the combination of all of those things. It's savings, and because it's a HELOC, it, it, it is effectively borrowing. Yes. And do you have any cautionary tales about that? Have you run into people who borrowed to help their kids or didn't borrow to help their kids, and it ended up not turning out as well as they had hoped? Well, it's hard to find those stories today because in the last uh, two years, the price of homes has gone up on average about 30% or in some places as much more. So no one's taken a lick yet. Here's the thing that we are also seeing though, which was not mentioned in the CIBC report. We got a lot more co-signers than we ever have today. You know. I'm not excited by people gifting their kids money. In my mind, we live in a free society. If you want to take a hundred grand out of your HELOC and give it to your son or daughter uh, to use as a down payment on a home, I probably shouldn't be commenting on it either way. That's your business, all right? And we hope, we really do hope that you have got a rational concept about what you can afford in terms of that HELOC payment. Um, we have to hope it because the money's coming out and it's, it's getting put into a house. You're not getting it back anytime soon or ever. But the question becomes like how many people are going to also have to co-sign because we've seen a dramatic rise in co-signs in the last uh, 12 months. So that is a whole different, very dangerous subject. I mean, in, in our opinion, that's something we don't like to see. 
to be honest with you, in the mortgage business, we sort of shrug our shoulders and just say, we believe that your parent understood what they were doing when they gave you this $150,000. And we have to. Nothing else makes sense. It's free country. Yeah. And if prices, oh. if prices yep. keep going up, everything's fine. And if they don't, then we've, uh, we've got a big problem. So, okay, let's talk about the future. I uh, had a couple of people on Twitter asking questions. And of course, you're huge on Twitter, Ron the Mortgage Guy. Everyone knows where you are. Um, uh, Depeche asked the question, if we have 70s type inflation now, what's going to happen? What changes do you see, um, you know, as compared to now versus then? Were people prepared for it then? Are they prepared for it now? Well, first of all, like Kylie Jenner is big on Twitter. We, are, I am Oh, yeah. You and like, I think I, of I both of you. To, Twitter, I think you know, of both yeah. of you together. I'm not sure which one Kylie is, but I'm I'm a big fan, obviously. Well, Kylie is the is. She's good. She's pretty popular on Twitter. I think it's about 200 million followers. Um, okay, so 70s style inflation, late 70s, 78, 79, 81. Um, no, we're not going to have that kind of inflation because those numbers were in the 18, 20% per year. That is not something that's in the future. But remember, back when interest rates were also, you know, we, Interest rates were so much higher back then as a norm. Like if you were getting a mortgage in 1974, you were paying, you were happy to pay like 7.95%. So when it went, when interest rates went to 18 and 19, it was bad, but it was technically not even a triple. Triple today would mean you would end up paying about somewhere about eight and a half percent. So it's never going to go back to what we see, saw in in 79, 78, 81, because the baseline is so much lower. lower. So that's never going to happen in the near future here. Secondly, the Bank of Canada, it, even though it, it, in, it, there's times now under this new governor when they act somewhat like maniacs that you would, the governor would say 18 months ago, go out, literally said, now would be a great time to, to buy a house or buy a car, uh, for the money because interest rates will be down for long. He said that in word for word 18 months ago. And I really have to question why a Bank of Canada governor would ever suggest to people, get off your ass and go out and borrow money. I mean, it just doesn't seem like a you know, national bankers, central bankers comment, but it happened. So now here we are 18 months later, discovering that his concept of long is 18 months. And you know we might see higher rates in April. So uh, it's it's a bit deceptive what, what happened, but let's just accept it for what it is. But that Bank of Canada governor, if faced with a long time of 5% inflation, if we're if month after month we're seeing inflation rates of the, in the CPI of 45 to 5%, they will raise rates and they will raise rates until either inflation goes back down and therefore interest rates will stabilize or until some of the supply chain problems that do create some of this inflation we're seeing are ironed out of the system and inflation goes back to normal. But that's a long-winded answer, but in the end, I don't see that we're gonna see, when people start talking about hyperinflation and they start talking about 1970s style inflation. Well, I was actually around in the 1970s and the, the baseline case for it is not the same. And it's extremely unlikely we would see that kind of a close. Well, let's hope you're right. So Why So Serious has a couple of questions. Do you think the U.S. style mortgage is better for customers? Does he think 30-year amortization is coming back? So what does he mean U.S. Okay. Know, U.S. style mortgages are 25 or 30-year fixed terms. Instead of your mortgage renewing every five years, it doesn't renew for the whole length of the mortgage. You have the same interest rate for the 25 years of the mortgage. And that's different uh -huh. than in Canada where it's a 30-year mortgage, but it resets every year, every five years, whatever. Correct. The interest your, rate your resets. Your term is always less than your amortization. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, the benefit to the people in the States is, well, it's... Uh, it's, it's 30 years worth of mortgage, it's 25 years worth of mortgage. If you wanna stay in the same house or never refinance, you've dead sure of what your interest rate's gonna be. And by the way, there's no penalty. If you wanna quit that mortgage and leave and get another mortgage, there are no penalties such as some of the big penalties we hear about in Canada. The downside to it is 
you're always paying about 1% more for a mortgage than we are. So for a 25 year mortgage in the States, if it's 2.54 here, it's 3.54 there. Do we have 30 year amortizations here? Yes, we do. We do. For any anything besides a government insured mortgage, you're you're absolutely able to get a 30 year amortization. Why so serious also said it would also be nice to get a shout out to Mortgage Jake. I miss that guy on Twitter. Uh, Twitter. I think you and I would uh, would second that uh, second that emotion. Um, I, I, I miss I miss Jake. If, think about Jake at least a couple times a week. Yeah, he was he was a great guy. So um, wh- another question. This came in from Carlo. Where do you see rates? in the future. So if we were to look, Sarah, to one, three, and five years out, I mean, you don't have a crystal ball, I get that, but I guess um, you're saying that the likelihood is they will be higher. The likelihood is that next year they will be higher. That's, I don't, you know, I, I feel that if you're going to go past, I, you know, six or eight months, it's prediction. When you're looking at the next six or eight months, it's just analysis. They're two different things. By the way, uh, Carlos, if Carlos, listen, if, if I actually knew where the interest rates were in five years, I would definitely, and as much as I like Doug, I would not be on this podcast. I would be on an island that I own uh, in the Caribbean somewhere sitting on billions of dollars worth of money. Because if you really actually could know what interest rates are going to be in five years, you would be so rich. So nobody really knows. That's the bottom line. It's impossible to know. But for the next six to eight months, it's pretty evident rate rates will be higher in the next six to eight months. And do you think that that will ultimately lead to a pullback in real estate prices? Listen, I don't know, you know, I don't know what in the world will lead to a pullback in real estate prices. Um, Look, we've got to all realize something. In March of 2020, we were faced with a worldwide financial catastrophe and with a once in a century plague that is, hasn't been, hadn't been seen for over a hundred years. And the net result to the real estate market two years later is the greatest boom in the history of real estate. So if you can put those two things together, I can't, like I literally cannot. And so we all know that re- we, we could sit back and analyze some of the reasons why it happened, many different factors. But it does really prove that if we're going to try to predict the price of real estate in Ontario, British Columbia, heck, in New Brunswick, the price of real estate's up 40%. New Brunswick, okay? There are fewer people in New Brunswick than there are, I think, in Mississauga. So price is up 30 40%. Very tough to try to go against this market to try to, particularly when there's no housing inventory. You know, we're back to the environment where there's 10, 12, 15 bids on a house in the last three weeks. That's pretty common. Um, I don't know how that's just going to go away with half a percent or three quarters of a percent increase in interest rates. Because let's face it, even at 299, five year fixed, people can afford it. If you've got the income, you can afford it. Uh, you can, if you get 200 grand help from your parents, for a down payment, you could probably manage it. But the real key, not much inventory. There's not much inventory in Southern Ontario. Yeah, and so until that changes, house prices aren't going to be collapsing. Is there a different ratio today than in the past when you compare sort of ABC lenders? Um, like obviously 50 years ago, all the mortgages were with the A lenders, with the banks. Now we've got different tiers. Are you seeing any modification in that or is it still roughly what it was a year or two ago. Yeah, the, the big five banks, the big six banks dominate uh, the Canadian mortgage business. I mean, even for the mortgages that they don't write themselves, but on their own books, they supply the funds to some of the, many of the other companies that do AAA mortgages. Uh, so their money is there somewhere, uh, almost every time. There has been a dramatic growth in what is referred to as uh, uh, alternative lending or less than prime lending. You're, you're sort of not allowed to say subprime lending in Canada. It's sort of a bad word. You're not supposed to use it if you're in the mortgage business. But it's it's people who don't qualify for uh, the bank mortgage, a bank mortgage for various reasons. Tremendous growth in that sector. Huge growth in Ontario, particularly. Some in British Columbia, but really big growth in it in Ontario. And in Ontario, big growth in private lending. Uh, that's lending from a company that is no relationship to a financial institution. It's uh, 
it's a group of people who pulled some money together, or it's old fashioned private lending. It's just a guy who has a bunch of money in, in RSPs and is willing to lend it out on a private basis. I mean, it goes, it runs the gamut all the way to that, that small sort of subset. Very buoyant today. Um, those, those rates are lower than they've ever been in the history of Canada. You can get a private mortgage today with an interest rate of 5.99. And, and there's no qualification for it, except that the, the real estate be good. That, that the real estate, the loan to value on the real estate loan is 75% or less. And otherwise, it's private. I mean, the, the customer may not have any discernible income. They just have a down payment. So the point is, it's available. It's never been more available. And the rate has never, literally never been lower. 599 for a private first mortgage uh, on residential, if you'd have told that, to a mortgage broker 10 years ago, they would have bet real money that it would never happen. Never, it would never be less than 10%, never. And here we are today. Which is why you can't know the future. So final question then, this whole topic of, should I as a parent be gifting money to my kids for a down payment? What's your advice to them? How do you think through that decision? Well, first of all, it's your decision. It's, it's the individual's decision. If they have done very, very well, both on their stock portfolio and their uh, their home equity, and they feel that they really, really want to make this gift to their children, to or to a child, uh, they're obviously not children anymore, they're adults, but that they want to help out. And they feel that it's important, and it's important to have that um, son or daughter get a start in, their, in owning their own home. That's a very personal decision. If they have the wherewithal, do it or don't do it. But it would, it, it's highly, the ones that we see who do it, they have the money. I mean, the, even the CIBC study showed that more of the money is coming from liquid sources than it is from borrowing by far, almost 60%, 65% of the time. So that's okay. That's, that's a human being's decision. But co-signing, which I alluded to, where you're going on the loan to help your, your relative or your child qualify, that's a whole different thing. And, and that needs to be carefully thought about. Yeah, I've always taken the view that if you want to help someone out and you've got the cash, here's the cash, you know? And don't even think of it as a loan. Here's the cash. I may never get it back. If gone I can, forever. Gone, gone forever. forever. Yeah. Yep, it's gone forever. And if I can afford to do that, fantastic. But if I'm putting myself at risk, my retirement at risk by forking over that money, then if I don't get paid back, there's going to be a lot of resentment. Certainly Christmas dinner with the family won't be very much fun. So you've, you've really got to think ahead to, to make sure you're making the right decision. I mean, the notes I wrote down here is that my advice, if you're an adult kid, would be to ask yourself, can my parents really afford to help me or am I putting them at, at great risk? And can I afford the house I'm buying? If I couldn't afford the house on my own, I can only afford it with my parents kicking in the money. Well, I understand that house prices have gone way up, but if you've never owned a house before, you don't realize that a house is a lot more than a mortgage payment. There's your condo fees and repairs and maintenance and everything else. So can you afford everything or, all, or are you getting yourself into trouble? And you made the comment that, the parents have a belief in the gift given because they've owned a house for 30 years and it's gone up and it's been fantastic. Are they forcing their beliefs on their kids and saying, you've got to get into real estate? Well, hey, I'm a kid. I like to travel. I'm going to be probably living in a different city in two years. So I think the kid has to understand where they're going with it too. It's a, it's a different world. My advice for parents would be, are you jeopardizing your retirement by helping your kids now? Because even if you're cashing into a HELOC and you got tons of money, well, you know, that's money that you now don't have. And you made the point as well, Ron, that the um, stock market has gone up huge. So you're sitting on more money than you had before. Is the stock market going to keep going up forever? I don't know. I'm guessing not. So maybe you're not quite as rich as you think, as one of the banks keeps saying. Um, are you going to help all your kids equally? You got three kids. Okay, I'm giving 200 grand to this kid. Do I have 200 grand to give to each of my other kids? Or is that going to create a little bit of family uh, strife? What if the kid you give the money to ends up getting divorced? Well, the 
That matrimonial home now gets split in two, so your contribution is now going to the ex-spouse. Nothing wrong with that, but you should be prepared for that eventuality. And so I guess if you're going to give money to your kids, only give them what you can afford. And I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to slap a second mortgage on to secure what you've given them so that if there is some problem, at least you can you can get your money back or some of it. Do you see parents doing that or are they typically just outright gifts or is that after you're involved so you don't you don't really see it? Oh, no, we see it. We see some thoughts of it, of placing a second mortgage as a kind of safeguard against what might happen in a marriage breakdown. But Doug, you'd be very, very, very surprised at how energetic the conversation is from the spouse who has not got the rich parent about how ridiculously unfair it is to place a second mortgage on this property. Mm. Um, put it to you this way. Uh, I, I don't see too many of them. And I see a lot of gifts, but I don't see too many second mortgages placed by parents because that's a very, very awkward conversation. Yeah, honey, uh, my mom and dad want to make sure they put a second mortgage on the property because they figure you're no good for me in the long run. I mean, it, it, just, it just doesn't happen. I mean, well, it's, it's, it's a 1% thing. It's yeah. a great idea. It's a smart idea, but it's it's a, a low... It, it, doesn't sell well. Yeah. And if I had three or four kids, which I don't, and if I was giving them money for a mortgage, which I'm not, I would say, look, here's the deal. I'm going to give you the money for the, to, to, for the down payment. I'm registering a second or third mortgage on the property. And that's because when I die, that will be your, um, advanced share on my inheritance. So it's really more of a bookkeeping thing than anything else. Well, who could argue with that, I guess. So, however, I can see how it would be an interesting conversation. Well, we covered a huge amount of ground there. I really appreciate you coming on. So it is uh, Ron Mortgage Guy on Twitter. That's the, uh, I assume, the best place to find you. And then Butler Mortgage. What is that? Butler Mortgage. Do you know, do you know what that is? Butler Mortgage. Are? If you Google Butler Mortgage in Ontario, we're going to come up really quick and you're going to have access to our website every other way to reach us. Yeah. But Butler Mortgage, we, we come up pretty regularly on uh, Google search. Yeah. And you've got, it's not just you working there. You've got a whole team. And so you're uh, happy to help anyone else. Ron, I very much appreciate it. We will have you on again, and we'll see whether we were we were close or far away on what we were saying. There were a bunch of people on Twitter also thinking we should do a full show on cryptocurrency, but uh, we're not going to do that. So, because uh, you and I are not experts in that venue. Although I guess, hey, you know, ten years ago that was the correct thing, right? Instead of instead of buying a house that's only going up twenty percent a year, you should have put it in something else that goes up two hundred percent. So, so that'll be our next podcast, but uh, but not today. Ron, thanks very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Doug, as always. Thank you. Thank you. That was Ron Butler from Butler Mortgage. I will put links to everything we talked about in the show notes, the link to CIBC, how to find Ron on Twitter and everything else. And if you did enjoy this podcast, please share it, hit the like button, you know, subscribe to it, share it with all your friends. We very much appreciate it. Until next week, thanks for listening. I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30.